I'd like to call this meeting to order at five o'clock on October 8th, 2024. First thing, we'd like to review and approve the minutes from September 17th, 2024. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. All in favor? So move. This is your time now. I'm up. You're up. Uh, since the last meeting, we've processed five warrants totaling $21,578.13. Uh, Shelly sent out expense reports already, but um, if you have any questions, I can certainly try and answer them. She helped us with a bunch of overages last, last meeting and is still in the process of correcting some of the line items, I guess, that exactly. are different groups and stuff like that. So, oh. but I don't, unless you guys have any questions on. So there's nothing new. Okay. No. Nothing new. All right, thank you. Thanks. 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 See how quick that was? <laughs> that was easy, perfect. <laughs> Seamless. Like, that's it. Uh, Chrissy, your report, please. Uh, it's been quiet. Um, September was a quiet month as we settled in. We completed all the beginning of the year drills, fire drill, lockdown drill and bus evacuation drill. Um, Friday, this Friday, we'll have a reunification drill, which for those of you who don't know, is a chance to practice how we reunite students and families in the event that we evacuate to another location. Um, those of you who had children here seven years ago might have done, done that the day yeah. that the tanker rolled over on. Yes, I remember that. Up. So we are practicing uh, that part of um, reunification. Um, Fifth grade students held their annual mum fundraiser to raise money to put towards their trip to New York City in the spring. School pictures last week, girls on the run is up and running, and fourth grade went to Mike's Maze last week. Um, upcoming dates, we have the Tanglewood Marionettes coming to visit us on Thursday. We also have open house on Thursday, and then as I said, the reunification drill on Friday. And that's it for me. Any questions for Chrissy? All right. Next is public comment. If you, anybody has public comment, um, one of the things, you know, what you're going to talk about, one of the policies tonight, really doesn't have anything to do with the elementary schools. Um, kids have kids have opportunity to rec sports and other activities, but what we're talking about mostly with the policies at Frontier. But if you like to speak. You're more you're more than welcome to. So you vote on the policy? Yeah. We're we're gonna talk about it af after you guys have public comment and we go through the policies tonight. Okay. But if you like to speak one at a time, we try to keep it to three minutes, but I don't see 10, 20 people here, so take as long as you like if it's a little over three minutes. Okay. You're welcome. Sure. Yeah. Hi, my name is Holly Johnson. I'm the co-chair of the District Special Education Parent Advisory Council. And I appreciate you reminding us that um, this homeschooling policy about extracurriculars won't really affect the elementary school, but we decided to come because all the, all the schools have to vote on it anyway. Um, so I'm just gonna read a letter on behalf of CPAC that was signed by um, our community members. The Special Education Parent Advisory Council, or CPAC, represents the interests of special education students and their families within our community. All school districts, as you know, in Massachusetts are legally required to have a CPAC or a PAC. And according to the Massachusetts Special Education Law, our duties include advising the school committee on the education and safety of students with disabilities and meeting regularly with school officials to participate in the planning, development, and evaluation of the school special education programs. In this capacity, we respectfully advise the committee to oppose the proposed changes to district policy IHGB. These proposed changes to the homeschool policy are exclusionary and raise serious concerns about potential biases against disabled students, some of whom are homeschooled in our district. Our opposition is further underscored by the lack of discussion surrounding the proposed changes, as well as the absence of supporting data. The subjective amendment lacks the thorough consideration it deserves. A review of school committee agendas and meeting recordings reveals that different components of the policy were highlighted inconsistently, raising further concerns about the proposal's fairness and transparency. Um, I would also like to add that there was no information that went out to parents about this proposed change. Um, 
no one was knew about it except um, it was at talked about at the last school committee meeting and it was on the agenda but it was on as the policy number which most people don't know what that is um, I just want to thank you for your attention to the matter and urge you to reconsider the implications of the proposed changes and encourage engagement in a more inclusive dialogue for all children in the computing thank you, thank you. Hello, my name is Mike Donana. I'm the father of two children. Uh, one is a special needs ch child who we homeschool and the other attends the local school. My homeschooled child gets up early. He completes academic work every day, including reading, writing, math, science, and he just started geography. He has never made this much academic and social progress until we, we began to homeschool. It was not an easy decision, but it was necessary. It was a necessary decision. He did so well that we have decided to con continue to homeschool. He loves to be active in the community. He went to a school activity last week at the local library where he met a local author, did art, read and ate pizza with other kids. He plays soccer and loves to run. I could see him joining a track team. He goes to music lessons and we want him to have the chance to play an instrument with other children who like to play music. We are working with the school in hopes of establishing a Best Buddies program to bridge connection with typical children and those with disabilities. He attended math night and family night. He goes to the school playground and knows many of the kids. He's an active member of his community. Our other child is educated at the local school. We have had to reach out numerous times to alert school staff due to behavioral concerns of other students, some of which were upsetting. Most of this most of these disruptive children participate in extracurricular activities. Currently, our child's entire class loses PE and other special time because several children are chronically disruptive. Those students participate in extracurriculars. We have even thought that homeschooling our child might be more productive and provide her with a safer social experience. I don't know how I can justify to our child that he can't participate because he's homeschooled, even though he once could. My child would be affected by this policy change, but the school did not alert me, involve me, or give me opportunity to ask questions or have discussions. We homeschool lawfully. We received permission and authorization from the superintendent. We meaningfully educate our child. My child is a well-behaved and academically achieving homeschooled child. What part of our scenario warrants excluding him? When weighing this policy out, it appears that it will hurt more children that be, than be of benefit. I urge you to consider this and oppose the policy change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nancy, and I'm, uh, I have two kids that live at my house. One is uh, homeschooled, and the other goes with the district, and the boy is autistic and both children are involved in the community and extracurricular activities. I post the policy change that will impact homeschool children for many reasons. First, our homeschool child is not now allowed to participate and has done nothing wrong and there is no way to justify to him if the policy is changed that he can't participate. Second, our family has followed all the required steps to have the homeschool plan approved and authorized by the district. I oppose the change because it impacts children in the community and has been, and, and there has been no space or time created for prior discussion. I oppose this change because it goes against the district's signed commitment to equity. I oppose this change because no other alternative alternatives were explored or discussed. I, I oppose this change because the district educated children who can't meet the academic and behavioral standards go through a tiered approach to disciplinary, disciplinary actions and remedial opportunities. I oppose this change because there has not been any objection, objective reason given. This leaves a lot of unanswered questions. Finally, I oppose this change because unjustified exclusion of a group of children feels discriminatory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, Ashley, do you want me to stand up or should I, you, can you I can sit, sit down? Sit I feel more comfortable. Whatever, whatever you like. Thank you. Um, I know that we 
um, are here and you will discuss this policy. Um, there's a lot of potential within the elementary schools to be able to offer extracurriculars to children. So that's our purpose here tonight. Um, I have reviewed the limited information provided about this policy change. I have also reviewed the handbook, policies, and other procedures of the district, and I want to share my informed reasons for opposing it. First, this change negatively impacts a group of community children, yet the district did not invite community discussion. Second, the policy currently provides inclusive access, which has been successfully occurring for years. The district not, did not provide any reason that was object, objective for changing a policy that inherently enhances our community, the development of children, as well as social emotional wellness. The district's current curriculum is based heavily on inclusion, yet this policy does not model that for any of our children. I would remind us that the Department of Education does not promote the exclusion of homeschooled children from extracurricular activities. The district adheres to the policies of the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association, which also does not promote the exclusion of homeschoolers from athletics. While the district suggests that homeschoolers may not be held to the same standards as enrolled students, I point out that the district holds the legal obligation per DESE to verify these standards and has established its own district application process specifically for verification. It is authored by our superintendent and states that home education proposal will be equal to the education provided to the students attending Frontier Regional and Union 38 schools in thoroughness and efficacy following the guidelines in Massachusetts curriculum framework standards. That is on the application and that is what we certify and is authorized by the superintendent. In considering the speculation of unmet behavioral standards, the handbook outlines a disciplinary response which is leveled in which the district makes case by case in a tiered, uh, tiered response, excluding any excluding an entire group of good standing children who has been vetted by the district's homeschool pro process goes drastically outside of the district's behavioral and disciplinary policy. I gently remind us that our community is still struggling to move forward after district educated children who were participants in extracurricular activities have repeatedly failed to uphold the district's own behavioral standards. Speaking from moral high ground is not a place where we can enact policy change. Going on, the district did not inform CPAC, which is a required advisory council that is legally tasked to participate, again, participate in the development and evaluation of district initiatives affecting special needs children. There are homeschooled children in our district who are special needs. I'd like to point out that the district did not consider any less extreme alternatives, nor did it, it consider proactive options that could better ensure that speculated standards are met. The policy change does not align with the district's recent commitment to equity, which is stated, which in it includes, we believe in the importance of having accessibility on every level and in every location to all students in our community for equity and inclusivity. In wrapping up, I'd like to point out it doesn't align with the mission statement, the community interaction agreement, the social justice commitment, and the commitment to responsive education, nor its statement of non-discrimination, which includes preventing discrimination or harassment of any individual working or associated with the school system, that the district is committed to maintaining an environment in which staff, students, and visitors are not subjected to differential treatment because of a legally protected characteristic. Homeschooling is a legal right. Finally, I want to disclose that since the community has begun to question this policy, that the district has been selectively responding to and offering an informal godfathered path for extracurricular participation. This has not been offered to all homeschool families, my family being one of them. I'm left to speculate that there could potentially be shadows in this policy that warrant our community exploration. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jess, do you want to share something with us? Yes, please. So I'm here to speak to you as colleagues and open meeting laws and things, so making a public comment seems like the safest way to do that. Um, 
I share a lot of the concerns that have been heard tonight, um, and I wanted to just make sure that you were all aware of some of the procedural options on the table tonight. Um, first, my own thinking about this is that uh, we don't have a problem in need of a solution when it comes to excluding homeschool kids from extracurriculars. We literally don't need this. There's not a problem that we need to solve. Um, and other districts also don't think that it's a problem. When I asked Darius last week, he could only name one district in the state that has an exclusionary policy. So if we start passing this in our district, we're going to be the second one in the state. We're going to be statewide leaders in exclusionary practices, which I don't think is a distinction that Frontier and Union 38 wants to have. Um, I've found that every argument in favor of it is some variation on a mindset of, well, these are our kids, and those are not our kids. But actually, as school committee members, we're elected to serve all of the kids. They are all our kids. Um, and public education is really to not just to uplift the individuals, but to serve society by having a well-rounded and educated electorate and workforce. So taking away these opportunities from those kids undermines our mission as school committee members. Um, as an elementary music teacher, I have had homeschool students dropped off in the middle of the school day just to take my class. So I actually believe this does impact the elementary level. Um, there have been some minor inconveniences related to it, but nothing that would make me ever want to kick a kid out of my classroom. Um, so uh, two things I just want to make sure you're aware of procedurally tonight. Um, if you don't want to be the first ones to go, you don't have to. You could table this vote until next month. Um, but tonight at the Frontier School Com Committee meeting, as a member, I'm bringing an amendment that I'm going to move um, to just remove that one clause so you could pass the rest of the policy, which does need updating. Um, this just removes the clause about restricting access to extra extracurriculars. Thank you for letting me speak, and thanks for taking seriously your job to represent all the kids in Wheatley. Thanks. Thanks, Thank you. Do you have another thing that you um, give to these guys, please? Just to read. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for all your input. Um, like I said at the beginning there, I mean, it really doesn't have anything to do with our, with our, our elementary school because the town has athletics and rec, rec department and stuff. But like Jess said, she teaches uh, art at whatever school you were teaching at. Was that the elementary end? Was that high school end or middle school? Elementary school. school elementary school, school. okay. School kids, yeah. Okay. But thank you. I mean, everything was a little uplifting to me, learning a few more things tonight. I appreciate that. And, and we may take one of your advisements in, in the hand, so. Um, so next we're gonna vote on our, our policies here. Um, Would you like to split them out and yes. do the A's first and yes. then talk about yep. um, the homeschooling one? Absolutely. One to one at a time, or as a group? You could do them as a group. Is there, is there any questions on them? We're not voting on this one. We're holding them. We'll we're hold going to do, right. gonna, I have some for questions. clarity, we're going to do ACA, ACAA, okay. ACAB, ACA, A, and the other two are regional. Yeah. And ACA. And do you guys have any questions on either one of, of those particular yeah. ones? Again, these were the ones based on updating our handbook to fall under the new Title IX law that passed in August. Yeah. Recommended by our attorney. No, I'm good. You want to make a motion for those? Um, sure, I will make a motion to approve uh, ACA, ACAA, ACAB, ACA-R, and AC-R policies. I'll second that. All in favor? So moved. Now we have IHBG. Um, we can we can table it and and see how we'll say frontiers tonight in a couple hours so frontiers can be voting on it which is majority but you have, you have a question questions. go ahead um my first question is are do all the schools have to vote the same way no no so so technically as i said this policy doesn't affect the school it's been our practice that we bring policies in front of all schools even when the regional school is passing policies um, as someone stated in the audience the you, know, you could have after school activities here in the future so um, you know it is important to weigh in on that and you're weighing in on um, 
you know, families in your district. So while the initial effect of this um, policy would probably wouldn't affect anybody because there's nothing, all the intramurals and sport teams in the area are not run by the, the school itself. Um, My second question, thank you, mm -hmm. is why are we changing the policy? Why is it being brought forth, I guess? Right, so I, I brought it forward, we went to the policy review committee and at that time we pulled it aside that it was out of date. Um, and that within it, they, I see there's an, also an equity the other way where we are holding students at, they're looking at the frontier region. You know, um, frontier regional students are held to different standards that are about it, different standards than the homeschooling students in the sense of attendance, intensive of assessment, um, intensive of having to have grades on record to be a participant. Um, right now, homeschooling students are upon our foundation enrollment, so budgetarily, they, we actually lose money for them not being enrolled in school. Um, and it's just it's a philosophy. We're doing so much work about the whole student. We're doing so much work about creating leadership and talking about, you know, working with um, students within the school and, and on top of that. And right now it's it's kind of a pick and choose where someone can drop off their kid at the end of the school day and they can participate in that, but they don't have to participate in all the things that make it a frontier community. And so it is a discussion. So it's not like, um, I know just talked about this, you know, another, only, only one other school in the state. It was, was discussed up in Greenfield. Um, in the past few years. They ended up tabling the conversation for athletics, but not for um, uh, uh, extracurricular activities. But it is a nationwide conversation. In most states, the um, state makes the decision. And it's about like 24, 20, 24 allowing students for homeschool to participate, 20 not. Um, Massachusetts is one where it's local control. There's about five states that are set up that local control does that. So it's you're not alone in this conversation. Um, it's not out of you know out of the blue. Um, it's happening more and more. I think as you're seeing specialization in sports, this is a way where students can um, be able to take play, take part in a extracurricular sport activity, but also be able to manage their lives differently outside of such. Um, and so that was the, it, it, I thought it was worth bringing forward for a conversation, you know, and I know it certainly has um, um, upset people and got some people um, fired up about the changes and I understand that. Um, one clarification is I did receive a note from the current um, uh, participant in Sports at Frontier and anytime the school has done a change in policy which affects the standing of a member of the in, that's already been a participant in something, they've been grandfathered in to continue through graduation. Anytime we change graduation requirements or anything, someone who is in motion um, already in that has been grandfathered in. So that's why I communicated to that person because they reached out to me because it affected them directly. So I did not send that to every homeschooled parent that if you, you know, because there was no, um, at the time there was no, there was nothing being taken away from students because of nothing been offered at that level. So. That, so that's, you know, on that particular one, I was reaching out to that, that student who reached out to me regarding what about his, his eligibility. So anyways, that's why it's in front of you. You know, as you know, Bob said, you, can, you could table it. It doesn't affect you guys directly. And to take the lead on that, it's, um, you know, it's your choice. It's, it's, it, it's not going to be a an question and answer back and forth here. I know you have a question. No, I, I just have a comment. Okay. You know, he brought, he brought up about money, you know, but as a, as a parent, when your child participates in a, in a sport, there's money you have to pay for the, for the involvement. So I understand that homeschoolers aren't getting, you know, the same amount of money as kids in the district, but as far as sports and stuff, we all pitch in for that. Yeah, Henry, you... No, those are actually in my two okay. questions as well. I wanted to make sure I understood. And Henry's, just to let you know, and I'll, I hope you think of that, he's a teacher in Northampton schools, so I'm not, I was, I didn't get a chance to ask him this week, you know, how homeschooling at his school or anything, you know, I was trying to get his feedback a little bit. If you want to have any feedback, fine, if, if it's... I have an email out to the school committee there to see where 
they're at on this. I don't think it was brought up at the most recent school committee meeting, but I imagine it, it's okay. a national okay. conversation. So I'm curious to see where they where they lie. And like I said, we can you know you can make a motion. We can table it until. Yeah, I mean, I'm not necessarily going to vote the way Frontier does. Right. My thought is at the elementary school level, I would never want to not include somebody. I think you know, sports at Frontier are very different. That's a different conversation. Um, if there are after school activities happening in the elementary community, I don't see any reason why we couldn't include homeschool children. That's my point. Right. And we were, and we were talking earlier about the girls on the run. <coughs> yes. We which is which is nothing really to do with the school. It mm -hmm. It's it's but anybody can participate in it, right. and you know they do meet here. But it's it's like having rec basketball. They're having rec basketball, and you're having an extracurricular activity after school with the running and stuff. So right, which is not part of the school. But my thought is, if in you know if we vote on this and we say no, then in the future, if there is something that the school does and those kids are not allowed to participate, you know, I don't want my vote that way to affect yeah. those children. So to echo that and. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but it seemed like the three things you were addressing in the concern, uh, or you know, positing as this potential uh, disagreement points were the cost, the money, which I don't fully understand. And then, the, you know, the cost I, I don't think is a is a is a is a hinge point. It's just a, it's, no, it's, it's something, something to consider. Which I didn't. Um, it's one that the, the state doesn't consider them to be enrolled in our school. Got it. Um, and to your point too, I, I understand this drive for wanting a community of individuals participating in a shared experience. But I also think, especially at the elementary level, part of what we're trying to do here is open doors. And I would, that feels like the individual might outweigh the group when we're looking at potentially excluding someone from having access to something. And again, obviously not right now, but if there is something offered here, I feel pretty icky about saying no. Um, and then you mentioned standards as well, sort of students being held to different standards and I feel like that's already been negotiated by the state saying that there are different standards but that one does not weigh the other or one having this standards can exclude this one you know the state has already come to an agreement with the difference between homeschooling and what happens in the school so I, I wouldn't want that to be a reason then to sort of create this divide to, to borrow your phrase sort of an us versus them mentality so I'm sorry with you is that my, my gut reaction uh, to this and to the thoughtful commentary that we have is, is very much that um, at this level, I'm, I'm... Yeah, because there are no, you know, standards as to which a child can or can't participate in something at the elementary level. Frontier is very different. You know, I have a child who participates in athletics and the standards are high. And whether there's a, a way to measure that for homeschooled yeah. students, I don't know that, but there should be. Um, but we're talking about elementary school, and I, I don't feel like there's any reason to exclude those children. I asked Darius earlier about how many kids in Waitley, correct me if I'm wrong, Waitley, we have two homeschoolers in Waitley, unless you could tell me different or something. Frontier, we have 25. And the other question, and I know at least one of them, the, the uh, young gentleman is on the football team, but I wasn't sure about the other 24 that are they participating in anything now we're talking frontier we're not talking lately but you know i'm just you know i don't i don't know that answer on the other 24 kids other than the one general the one kid that's playing football uh for extracurricular activities and stuff you know if if the other 24 don't participate and i'm not saying that's right that not have you know to have the new policy but if 20 other 24 kids aren't participating in anything that they could have been doing, you know, tell me, tell me something different. I mean, yes, there's going to be new kids coming down the road that may want to do different ones. And, you know, maybe COVID, you know, had something to do with homeschooling a little bit. Um, you know, it was better for families to have their kids at home. But there again, it's it's the extra extra correctly activities at the end of the day we're we're there again we're talking frontier. And I understand what you're saying there and you know, you know, 
we're talking little kids and you know like i said it's different it's a different discussion it's a right. totally different thing and i mean i would like to table it at least till next month and 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 vote on it if that's all right you, you that's, know that's make a, i'll make a motion to uh table policy 1h or i b excuse me i h b g table it until next month i will second that Okay with that? Yeah. All in favor? Thank you. And thank you all for. Yeah, thank you. You know, you know, it's not this goes in this year and goes out there. We we do listen. We do listen. Holly's been here many times over the years, and we always listen to Holly, whether it's here or at Frontier. So, but thank you for coming. New business, um, capital planning. Yep. So I sent off the PDF version of this. I will present it up on the screen. Okay. Is there more than one? Did you guys get that? Yeah. Yeah. You can also follow on the screen. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, oh, is this your copy? You can. Okay. I'll look over here. All right. All right. So, um, and the screen will really look at it. All right, so you know this is the, the uh, what we look at from year to year into the grays, what we've completed in the recent years. It goes all the way back several years of all the different projects we worked on. Um, blue is in progress right now. We haven't completed the door jams, um, but you know we still have to get one more door up. Right? Where is it? For this phase. This phase, yep. And so we haven't completed that, or and sometimes it, or if we haven't paid the bill, that still could be on that list. So we are looking at just, you know, Waitley's going to be in a tough financial spot, as we talked about this coming year. Um, I think it's important to understand that as we ask for capital as well, because um, money might be coming from the same pot from the town. I think um, talking about the continuing the AC phase two of two, um, whether or not we get this still a large number dash to the town. Last time we had some help with ARPA. Um, which is, was, you know, help us get some things through. So whether or not we get that or not, if we have to break it down to, you know, 2A and 2B in order to get it through, you know, we'll have that discussion with the capital committee and with the town, but that's really what we kind of recommended moving forward. Now, um, just I want to look at some of the twos because those are stuff that's coming <laughs> coming down the- That roof? <laughs> that roof. <laughs> Is the roof? Yeah. No, it's three. Right? So I think oh, roof, it's a three. Yeah, we already made a three. Yeah, so, um, so basically, looking at hallway carpets um, at the upper and lower wings and inside the airlocks, those are your, I don't know what they're called, airlocks. What they call like foyers. What, what are they call foyers. Well, it's the area between two sets of front doors. So, like yeah. when you walk in the first mm -hmm. set, yeah. with, you still have to go through one of the four doors. And, I like the idea of airlock that you can hermetically seal that space like, if you need to. Exactly. The little wind kind of goes yeah. through. Yeah. <laughs> um, we still have more door, exterior door jams to be replaced. Um, they're not as in bad shape, but they're certainly on the list. Um, main hallway floor replacement, cafeteria tile, tile replacement, and um, stucco on the back of the building. Chris, you know what's going on with stucco and the deteriorating? Uh, it must be that one. It's is, deteriorating. That one is new. Um, and then replace all the exterior lighting with LED. Um, and that might be something he's talking with advanced energy engineering community. We probably might get a, a uh, probably working on that. You'll see that probably is there, paid for by someone else. Sorry, yeah, since okay. there are some of these, it looks like you would, I would imagine, you would get grant support for. And I don't know. So if the energy is, one, we've gotten grants before. Frontier did their whole. Okay. So this is what we just have to ask if we didn't get any grants. Right. Okay. So that's how much right. And so sometimes we have to front the money and then you get rebates. And so that's what we did with the you know, with the mini splits and such and then with some other ones as well. Um, the roof replacement's on there and that's gonna be that's a larger conversation with the town when they're ready to go about doing it. Right now the roof is you know, we are paying between ten and fifteen thousand dollars a year in costs to repair it. Um, and those costs are gonna only continue to go up due to the loose um, fasteners, they've refastened and refastened and refastened and they've kind of reached end of life. 
we kind of talked about that, but again, um, you know, what we would do is clean up this document to be presented to the town about what's, you know, coming down the stretch. The other thing, obviously, is, not obviously, but the next thing on the list is the boilers. Um, and that is another thing working with the town, the town energy committee about, you know, what is the next phase? Um, Can I ask about that as well? Yeah. Does it make sense to replace the boilers or is this an opportunity to think about um, kind of like a geothermal or something on a scale? And I have no idea. What you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, yeah, you can do that. No. But I, I know there are like rebates for that as well. I'm just sort of curious does right. it, if it's replacing the boilers, does that mean 20 years down the road we do it again? Mm -hmm. Or is it like pay more so, now right. and it's a forever? Right. So those are conversations that we can have. Um, the when it comes to so right now it also attached to the with the mini splits being put in they have a heat element in them too so um, right. we just ended up doing boilers at Frontier and we did boilers at Sunderland and the there was talk about whether or not you can go geothermal that has yeah. very expensive okay you know that kind of thing for um, what you're getting I guess you could say it's not a huge physical plant for geothermal that kind of stuff but I'm not an expert in that area. I'm telling you what we did to other things. What I'm saying is that these boilers are coming end of life. And when it reaches too cold, even the mini splits can't work at that temperature. So they're the emergency heating, not emergency, but they're the, the, you know, the last five degrees you need to heat a room. That and it's far more, I believe it, at the colder temperature, it's far more efficient to run off of, you know, our system is based on the hot water heat being pushed through. You know what I mean? It's creating, that's what's being yeah. created here. And so those boilers could last, they're not broken yet. They could, we can go another five years, you know, until one of them, you know, does break and then we kind of speed things up. But that's kind of how boilers do. They can, they can kind of chug along for a while. Right. Um, are they 34 now? They're, 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 they're 34. Some of us are older than 34 and we don't talk about that. Um, they're just on the hall. So, um, but right, so, but there are, for, you know, where we have to be planning and getting energy committee um, involved. If we're gonna go with different type of system, like we talked about like, what does electric heating, water heating systems look like and that kind of stuff. And like, what is the real BTU savings and cost? And, you know, plus the outside, you know, any outside money that can be used and that kind of thing. Um, geothermal, I've only heard about using that in much larger facilities mm -hmm. to get your, your bang for your buck, unless someone else is going to pay for it. You know what I mean? So we are also keeping an eye on what comes out from the state. Um, it feels like, you know, which I'm anywhere you want on this, all right? Um, you know, we are looking at, you know, the state, you know, you know, we talk to our state legislators about, like, why isn't there more packages, like zero loans or that kind of stuff, if you're redoing your roof to throw solar on the same time? And the kind of question is when we grew up, you know, we'll get solar, you know, those kind of things. Right. Those are all um, things that should be discussed as we go through it. But I have to put on this list what we think might break soon, right? And, and then what it's going to cost to even Steven replace it out, right? So within for, reason. Within re and so at Frontier, you know, they went, you know, we had conversations about it and there was just no way we were going to have the money to put in. In, in a timely fashion, a geo geothermal plant, or um, you know, you have to be able to set up the whole thing, and or the electric ones were not feasible. Okay, um, that was okay. And however, we went to you know fossil fuel ones that are high efficiency with uh, twelve or fourteen different stages, where the old burners had three, high, medium, and low. Now you could just kind of turn them on. You can turn one on, another on, portions of it on, so you can do just low heat instead of turning on the whole thing and wasting a ton of energy. So we have a ton of energy savings alone just by having a more efficient, we went from, I don't know, it was like 40 or something percent to like 80 something percent in efficiency of those boilers. So even though it's still on, and this building's on natural gas. And so that's something, you know, in Western Massachusetts, that's actually something that you, with all the stopping of um, pipelines and that kind of stuff, if you're on natural gas, it's one thing to consider if it's worth staying on it. So these are all conversations for a bigger thing, but okay. you've got me going. I, 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 somebody in town uh, married Adam Quinville's daughter in town. So I'm going to reach out and see if maybe we can get Adam to come look at the nice roof he put on not many, I mean, not many years ago and tell him about a problem. You know, it's only sure. I'm, I'm just going to throw it out there. Just to, what he put this one on? Yeah. 
can I, can I ask about that? It's a story I don't really understand in the sense that we have, a, and I get the, the every year what we're doing to try and stave off roof collapse and leaking. Right. No collapse. No collapse. Not in this district. Not in this district. So the, again, I'm on a streak of talking about things I know nothing about. So. I am in favor of staving that off. Yes, good. I think we're all on board there. That's good to clarify. Um, was it not discovered until like a warranty had expired or the, you know, like how, how, I just like, and again, I haven't replaced my roof and I'll, well, actually I actually did it this summer, so I shouldn't yeah. say it, but that was, you know, it's a small potatoes, uh, Versus. compared to here. So like, what happened when we discovered it? Was there just like, oh, we just have to accept it? I mean, I, I, I think the fruit, correct me if I'm, I mean, there again, I'm not even sure what year we did it. So I'm, I'm going to put. 10 years since we put the metal roofing on at least. Because the idea of the metal roof is that it's supposed to last forever. Right? That's the reason you choose it is more expensive. Well, the reason why we chose what I remember, because I was part of it, yeah. is that the metal at the time was basically the same price as asphalt. Right. Now it's double what asphalt is. Right. So back then we figured the metal roof we wouldn't have to worry about well, well, yeah. It. So I'm just wondering after it's built and we realize it's built wrong, what happened? Yeah. I, Nobody. Okay, that's a. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, and we, was, maybe we could talk to Bob. Well, that's what I'm wondering. We talk to Bob. Like, oh, no, that's buyer beware. But it was done ten years ago. We can ask the town. This, this is tw we see twenty. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I wish it was ten years ago, but no, it's twenty. I mean, so that, that, I don't, I just remember, if I don't ever... remember the roof project. So I've been in the district 17 years. I don't remember this. Project. So it's before it predates you, let's say, right? And I'm just curious if there's a history of communication between the builder, you know. They're... Other than spending the money on putting the bigger fasteners on to grab a hold of something, the whole thing's in place up there. I mean, that's what I can remember. And there again, I don't know what the warranty was. If they were like my roof and they put the wrong roof on, I would think I would have some legal ground to be like, no, you owe me a roof that it's works. It's probably not the the wrong roof. Yeah. It's the yeah. installation. That still feels like it's part they, of the... They say it's the wrong roof. They say it's a barn roof. A should never, barn they roof. should have never, so, should have never <laughs> been put on the school. This is a but that's mystery. that's the yeah. that's town talk. You know, I, yeah, I yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, right. I love town talk. Um, I'm too, uh, <laughs> and I'm gonna find I'm gonna find out if they make two I different no metal roofs for for barns and then for for it's school. the idea that the fasteners were that you can see the fasteners versus right if you look at okay. other metal roofs you don't see the fasteners the metal roofs I put on all have fasteners so all have screws with a rubber rubber washer on it so when you uh, cinch it down the rubber washer prevents any water from going down. Through that screw hole in the house, or is there sheds? Well, sheds. Well, it's I mean, yeah, no, no, no. All right. So, do you want me? So, I will find out that information. I, for you. And I'll bring I it back don't to want to give you a huge task, but I'm just it's not a huge task. It's like, well within my okay you scope of service. Like, we're, we're, and I'm just thinking, like, isn't there someone else who could be responsible for replacing? Yeah. No, it's not that. It's just I'm so curious that we. The language we use around is like, yeah, we got the wrong route. <laughs> Moving on. It's like, well, hold on. Yeah. I see 600,000 on the item list here, and it raises a couple red Someone flags for me. Yeah, that's sort of what. <laughs> also, I don't know what that Google link is. I don't know that I credit card anymore it. use. That <laughs> yeah, was the ch -ch -ch one. Oh, so um, the Google link is part of the original document, and this. this I can't. Is. I was just curious what was on it because I can't. This that you shared. Oh, Did you? Can you get it? No, no. Is it because it says you don't have access? Or and when I click on, yeah, it says I don't have access. Did you give them a PDF version of? I gave a PDF, but I don't have access to it either. Okay. All so the information we need is actually on that Google. Yeah. That's the pictures. Though. Okay. All right. All right. I was just the pictures of the. Yeah, you showed us earlier. Like before before I, I before I reach out to Adam Quinville to this and get his point of view, which I know probably what it's going to be the answer. But I'm also going to say, you know, your daughter lives in this town now. Don't you want those two kids? Well, she's pregnant with number two. Do you want those kids to go and eat the safe roof? I'll put the guilt on there her, baby. Wield it like a, yeah. If you see it on TV, Adam, it's sure, me, sure. Bob Hell on Westbrook Road. All right. Do we don't have, do we have to? 
vote on any so capital there's, planning? No. So okay. you don't have the, you know, okay. I mean, I guess you don't need to vote. You just need to let me know that you like yeah. what you saw. And that, that's kind of what we want me to package up to go to the capital committee. Yes. Which is right. the AC and just let them know of the other things. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's fine. And we'll find out some more information on the roof for the future. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody, any of you guys going to MASC? So we, we don't have we don't have a delegate, which is which is fine. I mean, it'd be nice if one of us went, but it's at the Cape, right? Yeah, just during the week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't want us. Well, they're send administrators in their place. Taking notes on our yeah, appreciate it. Can't take a day off. And we have a MCAS presentation. Sure did. All right. On the big screen? Uh, I think it'll be on the big screen. I think I can point your attention to things. I'm going to move. Let's make it a slide show. You can leave. You can leave. Bingo. Yeah, you perfect. Well, thank you very much. I mean, honestly, it's you don't like our company, so. No. <laughs> on to the next. All right. <laughs> you have to tell me next slide, though. I will. I, I can tell you next slide. You have to tell me next slide because I'm not actually running off of that. Just presenting off of that. Okay. Okay. So, um, right. This you're in the is right place. what? That that slide. Make sure you're in the right place. I'm in the right place. <laughs> this is an overview of the 2024 spring results from the MCAS test. Um, out of curiosity, have you all looked at it, wait, wait, these scores at all? So. A little bit. Okay. So. I'm going to present a fairly neutral report because the way I like to look at data in conversation with others is to say what questions does it raise and, um, you know, look under the rug and then look under the rug again and look at it from multiple perspectives. I'm going to try not to draw conclusions until the end when we can talk together about what you think of the takeaways that are on the last slide and um, we can move it from there. But Also, they haven't seen parent report yet those are going home on friday okay they're going home on friday so the overview first i just want to say um what the interim commissioner let the administrators in massachusetts know ahead of the release is that statewide the 2024 mcas scores show a plateau or a decline in all major categories since the pandemic um so when we look at graphs since 2019 and there was no mcas in 2020 there is a peak and then it goes lower and lower and lower um, statewide, the correlation between wealth and achievement is concerning. That gap has been widening over the last few years, despite the Department of Education's um, many incentives to educate and um, work on initiatives to close that gap. And um, from the state, student absenteeism remains a challenge across the board for recovery efforts. Um, it is clear at the state level to see a correlation between attendance and achievement, which kind of makes me feel good that you have to come to school to achieve well. I'm glad that there is a correlation between attendance and achievement. But those are messages from the state. Some of them will be reflected at Waitley and some of them will be a departure from Waitley's reality. Um, but that's some context. At Waitley, um, we had 63 students participate. 100% of our students participated in MCAS. Um, usually, historically, um, in the last four years, our achievement has been above state average. Not by a lot, but above. And this year, scores are a bit below, except for science, which is far above. And when we get to science, we'll understand why science is an idiosyncratic test and um, doesn't really follow the same kinds of trends or give us the same information as math and ELA. Our rating as a school is moderate progress towards targets. The targets are set by the state. They're not set by us internally. And so the overarching <coughs> question um, is what's going on? And next slide. Okay, so here are some facts. Um, this is about achievement, not student. Um, well, okay, this is the top line is about achievement <coughs> and the second row is about growth. Um, the percent of students meeting and exceeding expectations in ELA this year is 39% at Wheatley of the 63 students who took the test. That means that they scored 500 or higher. And in math, it's 37%. Um, in both cases, these are a drop from the previous year's achievement scores, and it's a little bit lower than state average. Um, 
the growth for students is comparing the way that the growth um, number is, uh, the formula for ascertaining the growth percentile is compared to students who performed like you did at a similar size and type of school as you last year, how much did you improve or plateau or decline? <coughs> so um, our growth is a little bit lower than the previous year, but higher than state average. And in math, um, with 56.9 growth percentile, it's significantly higher than last year and somewhat higher than state average. Um, <coughs> can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah. At a school this size with only 63 parts, I'm afraid I would lower the math score, just for the <coughs> record. So each student right. accounts for how many percentage points? About 2%. 2%, yeah. okay. Yeah, about 2%. And one question you might take away from, I mean, there's a lot of questions you could ask from, from this data set, but one that struck me is how could we be performing so much lower but have so much more growth? Because it would seem that if we had significant growth, then we wouldn't be below, uh, we wouldn't be dropping. But more looking at data answers that. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, I know there's a lot of language on the screen. Um, it all belongs together. So when I dove into the ELA scores, are, you can look at it in terms of reading, question, questions about reading, questions about language, questions about um, writing an essay, and questions about writing skills in general. I can tell you what those questions are like, but within just the reading and language scores, we did very well. In fifth grade, 72% of our students met and exceeded expectations, just the ones about reading and language. So it's not at all together, like everything's lower. Some things were higher. Um, it was low writing scores that impacted our overall achievement. Um, and so individual class profiles have a high impact on our school profile because we only have four classrooms taking the test, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. So I looked back at the 2023 scores to understand this a little bit. Um, we graduated a high achieving group of sixth graders Last year, um, their average scaled score in ELA was 517. 69% um, of the kids who are now in seventh grade uh, at Frontier met or exceeded expectations in ELA last year. Um, and we brought in a cohort of third graders that had fewer of 18% meeting and exceeding expectations in the writing, writing and essay questions this year. So that's how we could have high growth with low achievement. Third graders um, with 18% meeting and exceeding expectations, that's very low. And you don't get a growth score for third graders because you can't see how they did last year. So our growth is just about the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, and that's why that's in the blue. But losing that sixth grade class and entering this third grade class probably explains the significant drop. I mean, still, it's all relative to having 63 kids, but that's the drop. Yeah. Um, how did the third graders who were fourth graders last year um, compared to this 18%. The third grade the year before, is this lower? They did, this is lower than the third grade class the year before. The third, okay. last year's, in 2023, the students who are now in fourth grade did um, much better in reading, twice as good in the reading and writing. We were actually more worried about math last year yeah. that, with the mm -hmm. cohort that's currently fourth grade. Right. Um, so, um, that's some of what goes on when you look at the analysis. Also, I could dial in to the, the third grade class and it appears that a number of students may not have attempted the essay questions. Um, or if they did, it was one sentence or possibly the explanation for their score could be that it was supposed to be um, an opinion and they stated a fact. So that would, if you don't have the correct mode of answering a question, it's a zero. And it gives us something to think about in terms of um, test preparation and understanding those those distinctions. But it doesn't match what we saw with the NEWA tests. Um, we have other ways of, we have Dibbles as a data point for reading and writing, and we have NEWA tests. It's true that in the NEWA tests, um, the, they aren't producing writing, but they answer questions about writing. And so there was a mismatch, and I think that um, we are point, our attention is certainly pointed at writing, and I'm not saying that Writing is not an issue, but I'm saying there's lots of ways to think about these numbers and that we should explore it. Yeah. So I, I, maybe you said this, um, the number of students not attempting the essay questions that's across the board or just the younger grades? Um, so three, four, there five, were six, a or... smattering, and I don't know that they didn't answer it. That's a, 
but they didn't get credit for answering it. They got zero points. Um, there was a smattering in other grades, but it was mostly in the third grade group. I think I told you, usually I can go on to um, Pearson Access Next yeah. and print off what they did, what they wrote. Yep. And that's not there. I, I know. And usually it is I, by now. So yes. I don't know. That seems to be I have no way to, to know what happened in those situations until I see. Yep. Well, we have time to dive yeah. into this. We have a while. <laughs> um, but one thing that has come up coincidentally, and all of this is just fodder for thought, I mean, I would say that. Having only released the scores at the end of September 24th, this is the amount of analysis we've gotten to so far, but the principals hold data meetings and I'm involved in um, curriculum review meetings. So we'll, we'll have more ideas um, in months to come. But I happen to be working with the um, computer, uh, digital literacy and computer science team, which is all of the librarians in the district who teach media technology, because we're on cycle for a curriculum review in, in library science and media. And we had an expert come and talk with us about the role of keyboarding in second grade. And um, we have not been um, big on introducing students to keyboarding. We have been maintaining handwriting. We have <coughs> heretofore really valued um, the fine motor and really valued um, uh, the art of handwriting and the practice of handwriting. But what we're hearing and what we need to consider in committee is um, is it now time to be, because of the direction of the world, considering uh, more emphasis on keyboarding in second grade so that when they are, so for lots of reasons, but it might change our MCAS scores because they are required to type their MCAS essays. And they didn't used to be, not before 2019. They didn't have to, they could handwrite. I think it was in 2021 that they started, right when our scores started to go down is when they started having to handwrite. And if kids are using computers more and more at home and not getting that broad practice, it does is that something that could make a difference in terms of what we're seeing? I don't think we should make a decision about keyboarding based on MCAS, but if we could isolate that that was a factor, it would, it would make a difference to us to know. Um, I'm gonna say more about this later when I get to looking at some subgroups, but that is a question that's in process now and it tied in, it was a question anyway, but it tied into these MCAS scores in third grade. Um, I also believe that we need to rethink our summer supplemental academic programs. I heard the commissioner say that um, this is going to be a big summer for recovery because the pandemic efforts still haven't had an effect, but I'll tell you that we offered a robust program last year. We invited far more kids than took us up on our offer for summer programming. Our summer programming is 8.30 to 12 o'clock for um, three or four weeks. And um, we tried different models. We tried two weeks on ELA and two weeks on math. We tried a four week model. We tried a three week model with some of each to try to get people to come because we already saw um, a little bit of a lower, a bit lower attendance um, for kids who need extra help the summer before. So we tried some different models. We also had trouble getting um, highly qualified teachers to teach in the summer. I mean, we can find people to teach, but it's not the people who may be best at the recovery efforts. So even though I haven't met with the principals about it, one of my outtakes looking at our MCAS scores and thinking about what the commissioner said about next summer is gonna be a big recovery summer is we've gotta figure out other ways of, of pulling kids in and recruiting highly qualified teachers to do some of that remediation. Um, okay, do you have questions about this slide before I go on? Great. The math analysis um, from one grade to the next, there were no discernible trends related to subcategories. So um, geometry and algebraic thinking were some of the stronger subgroups, subcategories for third and fourth graders um, just this year. It was different the year before. Number and operations was the strongest leg for our fifth graders in 2024. Ratios and proportions was the strongest for sixth graders. And um, like, and this goes without saying that the <laughs> lagging leg was also different. And there was no really clear lagging leg the way writing was a lagging leg in um, the ELA scores. These were all fairly close together and no one consistent trend of there being an issue. Um, we will be watching the next three years worth of data on the impact of the math curriculum we've launched this year. So this is the first year of implementing a new math program. Um, Pre-K through five, we're using bridges, and in sixth grade, we're using illustrative math. It usually, um, 
usually there's a small dip when you start a new curriculum because the pace of teaching is slower as teachers don't know quite how to know <clears throat> things down and it takes longer you want to try everything and not omit something that might be very valuable but then the second year through you kind of know what what repeated itself and you kind of know how to pace things a little bit better and you get farther in the curriculum so i would expect that next year i would be happily surprised if we plateaued in math but um I would think it would be over three years that we would see that this curriculum was effective and really turning the trend. Harkening back to ELA, this is our second year with ELA for grades K, one, and two. Um, and our third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth graders have done, um, it's the second year for what's called the module part. This is the literacy section of our ELA curriculum, but it is the first year for a foundational skills program, which is the complement. Um, the reading rope is um, put skills like taking perspective and um, recognizing theme and identifying how characters change over time in the literacy section and skills like um, I'm going to a foundational skill in writing. A, a question that tricked our students um, was um, where in this paragraph would this sentence be best inserted? Like those kinds of deep language dives that are more analytical about written organization. It's that portion of the curriculum that is being launched this year. It's called All Block. And um, so you may be hearing teachers talk about it or kids talking about it. So again, I would give it three years to see what the overall impact is. Um, and we're gonna be looking at writing at the same time as we look at this curriculum. Because sometimes it's curriculum, but sometimes it's just PD on how do you teach writing regardless of the curriculum. So I wanna keep that in mind. It's not always the resource. It can be the, the teacher training and the content. Okay, moving on, good news is 82% of our students met and exceeded the expectations in science. Um, that's up 54% from last year, and it's 38% above the state average. This is the fifth grade class that was at 72% for reading and writing, so it could be a particularly strong group of kids. We have to wonder. It might not be. It might be a, an amazing curriculum. It might be an amazing teacher. It might be lucky guesses, but I don't think so. It's on the it's what? It's the parent you forgot. It's the parent. No, it's, it's the parents at home doing all the experience, all, all the cooking. <laughs> um, or generally strong, as you can see. <laughs> there are kids in the class. <laughs> so she needs the parent to. That's great. No, my older child is not in such a great class. So That's this one funny. A wonderful group of kids, yeah. Well, um, what, what five years of data and science can tell us is that we generally do very well, but it's always a standalone fifth grade group, and so there's no way to compare it to other years, and um, so you have to wonder what happened last year. Um, but I would say, what great news that since some things don't look as strong as we would like, that we can feel really good about the way that the fifth graders were engaging with science last year. Okay. So now I have some comparisons because it's um, essential to look at are we teaching all of, all of our children well or only some of our children well. So let's see, it's 15 out of 63 students participating in MCAS this year um, were students with disabilities, so about a quarter of the group. Um, student growth percentile, which means this excludes um, third grade because they don't have a growth measure, but um, our growth percentile is 56, that looks weird. It's not 56 students, it's our student growth percentile was 56. And that's students with disabilities and the growth percentile for um, non-disabled students was 58. So that's really good news that we are growing our students. Um, they're making the same um, degree of progress from previous years compared to peers in similar size schools, whether there's disabilities or not. I mean, and, it's, that's a huge number. Yeah, how close that is. That is you don't see that in many other schools, just have fun. It's no, very, you don't. It's very proud. Of it's very proud. Of yeah. And the students with disabilities grew more in math than the non-disabled students. So that is also very exciting um, and speaks well to our special education program here at Waitley. So it, it, you know, I would think that a significant disparity would be 10 percentage points. Usually that's where you start thinking that it's not about one or two kids, but a trend, but that's really close. So. I'm ready to go to the next slide. You're ready? I'm there. Okay. Okay, gender. Well, in ELA, 
25% of the boys met and exceeded expectations and 57% of the girls met and exceeded expectations. This is a pattern. Um, last year, 35% of the boys met and exceeded expectations, but 71% of the girls met and exceeded expectation. And if you go back further, you still see a difference between boys and girls in ELA. Um, and so this will, does require closer attention, but I'm gonna say that I have a theory, which is I'd like to go into the ELA writing score and look at boys in writing, because I have a feeling that it could be correlated. Um, mm -hmm. And in that case, I wanna think about key, the role of keyboarding because in my teaching experience, I have found that, I, it's anecdotal, but boys have appreciated, my, my male students have appreciated the way that they can transfer their thoughts onto the keyboard more quickly and more automatically than when they're handwriting. Um, and so what role does that play that begs uh, more investigation that it could be a correlation? In math, 44% um, of boys met and exceeded expectations and 32% of girls met and exceeded expectations. Um, last year, more girls met expectations than boys in math. So I'm not seeing a trend that's concerning at Wheatley, although you know, we know that state and nationwide, typically mm -hmm. the reverse is true that boys are outperforming girls in math. But it's nice to think that we might be an exception to that trend. Um, and then if we are, what are we doing to avoid that? Next slide, Darius. Um, ELA achievement correlated with income. Um, considering that the state uh, highlighted this as a major concern, I wanted to show that there is a difference between our non-low income students who took the test, every dot is a student, and our low income students that took the test. But it's not um, nearly as dramatic as it is in other schools um, uh, in our district or in the state. And one of the other things I look for is, are there high achieving students with low income? And the answer is yes, these, high, these dots are nearly in the same range as the high dots and there is low achieving in both places. So of course we always wanna close the gap, but I would say that um, compared to um, a, a concern that's statewide, it's not as big of a concern at lately, right now. Next slide. Is that where some of the other towns or cities around us that have more low income where you may get more help with grants and stuff to help with the low income? I mean, Say that one more time. With the low income, like with some yeah. of the other towns, like yeah. I don't consider Waitley a low income town, but there's other towns that may have more more kids or more oh, families. Yeah. Will that other what? towns have more support, I mean, have more, like, for example, get Title I funding. Right. But that's not what's going on here because a quarter of Waitley students are considered low income, just the way a quarter are students with disabilities. And it could be that the attendance is really good. These are questions I have right. to wonder, like, since we know there's a correlation of the low income students having high attendance, and is that a difference? Um, or um, is it the fact that we have a small school with close attention to every individual child and a principal like Chrissy, you know, that just like make sure, I don't know what it is, but is the parent? something's working. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or the two parents. Yeah. Good, good. yeah, Waitley has a quarter and that's not so yeah. dissimilar from the other schools, but the, but the yeah. gap is closer at Waitley than in other places. Okay, so here are some takeaways for now. Um, we're never done taking things away. We still have other data points to triangulate with, but Waitley had a dip in MCAS scores, which is something to watch. Waitley has a much smaller achievement gap related to wealth compared to the state, and Waitley students with disabilities had similar growth to students without disabilities. I feel like those are big things to take away. Um, we need to focus on writing, especially for boys, um, and we will consider alternate models for summer support to prevent regression in math and ELA. We're reviewing the role, the, the program, the purpose, and the timing of keyboarding instruction. And we will continue to concentrate efforts on family engagement as studies show a positive correlation between engagement, attendance, and student growth. So, yes. The, the keyboard thing, I'm, I'm thinking little kids that get all these Christmas presents and they're, they, a lot of them have keyboards. They're keyboards. Some so I, think some, yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of kids are learning keyboards pretty young in life, you know, I know you want them to write 
You know, I wrote for 12 years until yes. I graduated. My yes. handwriting stinks. Yes. But, you know, it's the keyboard. I'm getting to learn where I can just hit it. And I, you know, it's almost like me knowing what the exactly where, like a typewriter, where all the, the letters are and stuff. So yeah. I think the kids learn real early on I don't some think type anyone of keyboard. wants to reduce handwriting. So, but we, if we did want to add keyboarding in second grade in um, library classes right. and as a station during choice time in the classrooms so that third grade, would, they wouldn't be learning it three months before taking the mm. MCAS. Um, there are developmentally appropriate programs. We've just purchased Keyboarding Without Tears, which is, um, which is not gamified. It's, um, I could show it to you at another point in time, but we did some research on all of the programs in my committee and we picked one and three of the schools are piloting it and seeing what it's like for kids to take it. Um, it should be developmentally appropriate and it should reinforce um, some of the other literacy skills that they're working on. Is Waitley one of with tears, is Waitley one of the three schools? Waitley's using it. Okay, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Waitley's trying uh, we, it. Yeah. We, it. The company started as handwriting without tears. It's called learning without tears. The umbrella is learning without tears. But their first go was handwriting, handwriting many tears. many years ago was handwriting without tears. Yeah. Uh, but cool. you know, it's always a puzzle because there's pros and cons to introducing keyboards to little hands. But this does look like. Um, they actually are encouraged to finger peck because they are doing like liter like lots of people finger peck and it's better than trying to get your hands to do something they're not meant to do, but to get familiar with the keyboard and then they start doing proper handwriting position in third grade, but they're not trying to do proper handwriting position and type an essay. It just might be better scaffolding. So you're saying we should bring back typing to high school we're as a class? To, yeah, I'm saying we're, that's what we're going to do. Um, Next thing will be home this, economics. You, gotta have the, you used to play the old Zelda game where you had to write oh, open yeah. chest. You like that's where you learned to type. Yeah. Like, oh, I spelled it wrong. Is there? Um, <laughs> is, is this program keyboarding keyboarding without tears? <coughs> is that something that parents and students can access at home, or do they have to be in? I believe it can be accessed at home. Um, we're just now piloting it. Like our our committee just met in July, okay. and we just finished the PO, and I think. Kids are rostered, but we haven't really gotten it up off the ground yet cool. for the pilot well, year. Um, but if it's something that like parents can do with the kids at home, right? yeah. And we haven't um, broadcast this publicly because we're still in like the curriculum review session and the pilot. Like we're in the yeah. experiment and look at the data section. You haven't broadcast it publicly. Like well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's I mean, out of the bag. <laughs> I mean, we haven't. I'm joking. <laughs> we're working in committee. This is a pilot year. We're trying some things out. Good. We haven't made a long-term commitment to anything. Um, and keyboarding without tears is available K two. But we are just trying it one and two, um, and um, we're not trying it in every school. And we did purchase a different program for third, fourth, fifth, and sixth called Typing.com, which we are using this year. And mostly kids get those lessons when they're in the library media classes. So, um, but that's all part of why we have a curriculum review cycle. So every five years, we look at what's what's new and what's changing, and how do we meet those new needs. How did um, Waitley compare to the other three elementary schools? In what way? All the ways? Declining scores, I guess. Are they also declining in yeah. the other schools? Yeah, I would. I think. One, I think. Um, I didn't memorize this. I work really hard not to <laughs> create competition, and I really, really well, did. Curriculum like, being the same now, yeah. just just barely just now. Barely. Yeah. I think Sunderland went up a little, and I think everyone else had a similar trend. Mm -hmm. And when you look at Frontier as a whole, including the high school, it's a similar trend to Waitley. And if you look at the state, it's a similar trend. It's discouraging, to say the least. Okay. So with the ILT over the summer, with the instructional leadership team, they come in and we, we sort of unpack what happened last year. We look at end of the year data. We don't have MCAS data yet to look at. Um, and and I have I think four or five classroom teachers on it. So we really talk about like aside from data, what did you experience? Um, and everyone had a concern around writing mm -hmm. that was supported by student samples that they brought, um, and now supported by MCAS. And so when we were thinking about what our instructional focus would be for this year. Um, we looked at 
Jesse has these documents called um, look fors, and and it's you know to a large degree for administrators when I'm walking through classrooms, what is it I should be looking for? Um, and so we kind of ad adopted our instructional focus based on one of their look look fors, and so our focus is we will increase opportunities for students to engage in daily writing using standard English grammar and conventions. Um, so it's we're sort of ahead of the data a little bit. Um, I heard that. But it was because it's what they ex they were mm -hmm. experienced. Like there's all kinds so of data. they before these tests. Came right. Out. Yeah. And, and it's good to see that like what they were experiencing mm -hmm. is bearing itself out mm -hmm. in the data. Mm -hmm. um, third grade is, is tricky because it is a very complex process to analyze what a question is asking you, get information about it from the text, compose it and then have and to type, type it when you're then, not used to typing and yeah. then have to figure out probably how to, how to yeah. type so it's yeah. it's a lot we want to help kids to be prepared for that part and it's hard to you know one of the things having come from a school district where we had a great deal of focus and um, learning time spent on mcas prep um i, I don't want to tip us in the direction of, of getting away from the rich curriculum that we now have and focusing on MCAS prep. So it's a balancing act, like how do we provide the skills like typing um, as a way to prepare for MCAS without having to take something else away. Any other questions? <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, reports. The only thing I have, I talked to Chrissy a little bit because uh, J.D. Ross reached out to me about um, the little kids play area out here creating. I know you've been in the loop a little bit. Chrissy told me you were in the loop a little bit, but he reached out to me about trying to come up with either grant money, CPA money. Um, I think when we did the other uh, play structure out here, the big one, we used uh, school choice money because I was part of it back then when that happened. So, um, that where are you talking about? Which? Well, the little kids, a little uh, the the pre pre kindergarten are out front. Are about, oh, the front area, the little okay, front yeah. area. But if they do anything, Chris we've was, been talking about this. So the the little front area mm -hmm. was born of COVID. Right. I remember that. So yeah. they had to be outside the whole time, and teachers are outnumbered. There are three uh, teachers in yeah. there, and they're little, and I made me a little nervous. So we put up that mm -hmm. black fence. Um, that was never meant to be their playground. It was just a way to con <laughs> contain um, yeah. because there was the, we don't get a lot of traffic here, but there's a road right there. Um, prior to COVID, and part of my really having any idea of what the cost of, of playgrounds mm -hmm. is, um, I had invited someone, a salesperson, to come talk to me about playground equipment, and I was like, my, my yeah. eyes were ready to roll out of my head. Um, but we had talked about it in terms of having a having a section out there that is for early childhood. So it wouldn't be just pre-K, it'd be pre-K, K-1, possibly two. Um, and it's just really expensive. Makes the roof look cheap. Mm -hmm. Well, Sunderland did theirs, right? Like a couple of years ago? Yeah, when right now I have plans for Deerfield. They're looking at their pre-K playground and their K to four playground to be put core and play and some new ADA pieces and that kind of thing. And you're talking to get, I mean, each playground is around 400,000. A, a, a single play unit can cost between 50 and a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, I was looking at it, I'm like, so this thing costs as much as my truck. Gotta get into that place. Yeah. <laughs> like, and all a kid does yeah. is climb on it. Like I can put, I'll park my <laughs> truck and the kids can climb it and listen to the radio. <laughs> wow. When I've been looking at like natural things um, mm. that are made unnaturally, um, but like you could buy boulders and logs that, right. that are mm -hmm. fabricated. And the like for a boulder, it was like $5,000. And I was like, for just plastic rock. I'll just have someone around here <laughs> grab me a rock. Like, <laughs> Arctic Ocean stone and wow. see yeah. right. and So, you know, it's it's difficult because you know you 
the playgrounds that you construct versus what, you know nature running around playing right. in the backyard and what we've created over time but like you know the fall surfaces around anything you climb on have to be a certain thing so if you're going to do wood chips they got to be like six inches deep 12. Or 12 inches deep rather double that so how many you know pounds of wood chips you got to bring in every year and keep them raked out and but and so that you know the pour and play gets to be more attractive because you, you save money on yearly maintenance and it's a little bit cleaner and nicer that kind of stuff but it's really expensive it's 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 basically around 20 foot 20 bucks a square foot wow. you know so um we're just gonna buy one. Cause one JD, square. one square, you can <laughs> jump above it. <laughs> well, JD reached out to me because we have a play structure up at the at the center school up there yeah. that's not being used. But he talked to Keith already, and it's you know like any of them, they're cemented in. So it's it Can't would be really it. hard to take that one, which is probably pretty, pretty old. old. Yeah. Seen some we probably the days when you were at school. I was gonna say, I yeah. Wait, I someone know. asked me about it, and I was like, oh, I haven't seen it, but I'm just gonna guess the code has changed. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the regulations yeah. around that. Okay, but I think there's a well, JD reached out, he says, whoever he was talking to, um, there's, there's a lot of grant money out there, I guess, supposedly, right? So, so okay. between grant money, CPA money, and maybe you know. There again, when we built the one out there, I was, I was backing it because if we use school choice money, and I know we use it for a lot of things, but every single kid would have a, be able opportunity to use it if we use some school choice funds, where sometimes we earmark it for one one thing or another thing, and not every kid can participate with it. I hear you. It's gonna be a tough budget year. I wouldn't touch all school. I was just gonna say. No, I'm just. Shelly's here. Yeah, Shelly's here. Should strangle you. I'm just nicely. 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 Budgetary meeting, and I still don't quite understand the full web of how it works. There's a little confusing, but I've reached out to see if I can get some mentoring there because it's, they're on track for where they want to be. There was a little dip, but they were able to explain it in a way that made sense. So um, if you asked me to repeat it, I probably couldn't. Um, okay. So, yeah, it's going well. Okay. Darius? The only thing I'm, uh, I don't have a formal report, but the only thing I wanted to announce that is on our agenda. So, there's always been this kind of question whether or not you have to write vote next to things you're voting on versus not having to rate vote. And someone said, well, you didn't rate vote, so we can't vote on it. And so we contacted MASC because it came up in another meeting where they mm -hmm. didn't vote on the handbooks last time because they didn't say vote next to it. And, then, and we talked to MASC and they said, it is the assumption that if it's on the list that you will be taking action on that item. However, we looked at a neighboring district where they say votes may be taken. And so we're gonna write that on, on the top of next to new business and, to, and unfinished business now you get on your thing. It says votes may be taken. Just moving that forward, just kind of like one of those small Details like, are we voting on that? You know, you can take action on anything as long as it's on your agenda. Great. And okay. so we're adding votes maybe taken so it's clear for anybody from our old system of, you know, new policy vote versus, well, we'll write first read on policy, yeah. but other stuff, you, if it's on your list, you can be taking action. So I, I just, we're adding that language between that. Motion to adjourn? Or do you have to say that? Nope. <laughs> Second. All in favor? All right. I, Hey, you guys can adjourn the meeting with Outlaw.